Okay, so Janine has been here with Sky for five days. And when Sky arrived, she was highly adrenalized and she was pairing adrenaline with a lot of triggers. So we made a list of the triggers that she was um, reacting to. And we started trying to pair those same triggers <clears throat> with calm behavior. A lot of what we did was just having her exist in my house with my two dogs in a crate. And it sounds awful to crate her for 16 hours a day, but um, eight of it was spent sleeping. And the other eight was training where she was around low levels of stimulus and she had to just relax and learn how to self-regulate with um, you know dogs and people moving about. And that's really important. A lot of people don't want to crate train enough, but she really needs the crate to learn how to have just a lower baseline. So we kept her baseline quite low so she could succeed. Um, <clears throat> when to get excited and when to get calm. So if she does bark, and we like Shh, and stop it Sky, and we yell at her or just try to interrupt her in the way that normal people do it actually adrenalizes her and it puts her into opposition um, so what we needed to do was have a classically condi conditioned reward marker which meant you're getting a piece of food please release serotonin and what that was was never mind and we said never mind and we fed never mind and we fed the frequency of never mind is really nice i don't have to treat teach it to people hi baby that's my dog, babe. Uh, I don't have to teach it to people because they already know what Nevermind feels like. We used a lot of Nevermind when we were out on the road where she would look at something and rather than asking her to leave it, which is negative and it makes people freak out and it makes the dog tense because there's a history of, of um, punishment with that and it's also got a bad frequency. We just said Nevermind. She was looking at stuff and just saying never mind. So we taught the never mind at home and then we transferred it out into the real world at really low levels of adrenaline. So the times that I get really excited is when I'm doing recalls or I'm releasing my dog to a sport. Um, we're doing agility. I bring my energy up and it's contagious. I shepherd my energy and I shepherd my dog's energy to a place of excitement. But with dogs like Skye, she already has too much adrenaline. So for the time being, we need to keep our rewards really low. Because in order to succeed, we can't have her baseline of adrenaline amping up again. So we want to not avoid the triggers. We want to avoid the adrenaline bursts. And how do we do that? Well, we have to use distance. We have to keep her at a safe distance. I don't work dogs under threshold. I kind of work them on threshold. If they have a little lapse and they bark, I don't leave. I just get further away. I add more treats. So the three Ds are distance, duration, and distraction. Now, the distraction is the treats, but it's also my body. I can touch my dog, I can massage my dog, I can block them, I can push them away from the trigger. Um, I try not to choke dogs uh, or pull their collar, so I usually either have them on a halty and a harness, so I'm not hurting their nose and constantly having pressure on the harness. But I try to keep the pressure off the dog's neck, and one of the best ways to do that is to grab the collar by the side. When you pull a collar back, you um, instigate a tracheal response which shoots adrenaline to the brain. My whole thing with Sky was to keep her adrenaline low. No choking, no pulling back, and not a lot of this fighting and pushing and getting excited. Bring your energy down, <clears throat> place yourself in front of the dog. I'd run my hand down the leash, shorten the leash in a really controlled way, step in front of her, block her, get her calm, give her the distance she needed to, to succeed, and then start over. So basically when you're using the three Ds, you're using yourself as a distraction and depending on how distracting the other thing is, you might need more distance, right? Um, particularly with dogs that are kind of playful and very friendly, that freaks Sky out. It's just, I'm not sure what happened to her before you got her, but a lot of dogs just can't compute the amount of um, information coming in so fast as the space decreases too quickly. The duration, now duration also has two sides. Sometimes I need to make it short and sweet before I have a reaction and I'm drip feeding, lots of distractions, giving food, giving food, and I just get out of there and we don't have a reaction. But if we do have a reaction, we have to go further out and pair the same situation with serotonin and calmness because if we just leave, all the dog has learned is to be excited. It hasn't learned the calm part. And even if the dog gets excited then calm, I'm only just even the playing field. I've only got excited, then calm. I've got a behavior chain of, I freak out, then I get calm. I freak out, then I get calm. I need to go far enough way, away that I come out calm. And yes, I'm excited or whatever, but I stay calm. I don't have that freak out. So when you fail, don't give up. Don't just leave because then you've only got half of the equation solved. 
stay there at a safe distance. Do a couple circles, do some figure eights, do a little bit of obedience, right? But the whole thing, when I get my dog to calm down in a previously exciting situation, is they have that experience not releasing so much adrenaline. The longer you stay, it's like putting your foot in a hot tub. You put it in and you're like, oh, it's too hot. But if you keep your foot there, it's okay. And you have the experience. You get into cold water. Oh, it's too cold, I can't do it. But if you get in, you can do it. And you realize it's not dangerous. And that's how we have to desensitize dogs. We can't keep leaving situations or avoiding them. We have to be in the situation using good distance for safety, duration, as long as we can help hold the dog there without them reacting. And sometimes that's a very short time if the distance is too short, we just don't have the room, right? That's when I get out of Dodge quick. But then also think of yourself as a distraction, not just the food. So you're the distraction. I'm digging into my dog, giving her a deep tissue massage. That's gonna be way more distracting than just petting. If I'm standing in front of my dog, blocking them, and um, with my back towards what they're afraid of, clearly I'm not joining them in being afraid of that. I'm distracting them with my, my energy and my presence. The leash is a distraction, but don't be choking your dog off because when you choke a dog, you build adrenaline and get a tracheal response. So getting the halty is really important, but the, the halty for me is a great tool if you use it with a harness, but if you don't use it with a harness, you're gonna bald the dog's nose. There's gonna be constant pressure on the nose. They're gonna give them all, all kinds of um, chiropractic adjustments when they hit the end of that leash. So I use my harness as a as sort of like a break to slow the dog down. And then I use the halty to turn their head in peace, turn their head away from the trigger, always away or push them with my body pressure away. But I would never turn a dog into a tr trigger or push a dog into a trigger. So it gives me the ability to push the dog with my body, stop their movement forward and turn their head. That's what the halty is great for. I see a lot of misuse of halties. They're not gentle leaders if your dog is hitting the end of them and snapping its neck. Next thing I want to talk about is desensitization. And when we're talking about desensitization, we're talking about the five senses. If my dog interprets something and smells it in an adrenalized state, they store that memory in an adrenalized state. Unfortunately, what happens is that the next time they smell that, they get excited, whether it be for play or it's water. They smell water, they're going to go swimming. Next time you come back there, they're going to start barking before they hit the water. You need your dog to be introduced to smells because they store information mostly through their olfactory system um, in a calm way. So like, let's say my dog has an introduction to a cat and the first time it sees and smells the cat, the cat runs. Well, now I have a problem. The dog thinks of the cat as prey. What if I introduce the dog to a cat in just a really neutral environment, got the cat swaddled, and this is what you did with Sky. You had to get her calm and having lots of calm interactions with the cat so that she didn't feel like she could chase it and it didn't um, trigger a adrenalized response system. So with the five senses, we worked um, with men, particularly people walking by. And what I did is I introduced her to their smell with food before she ever saw them. And the important part about that was that she made this neutral memory of them. She didn't get adrenalized, then smell them and hate them. And next time she smelled them, she hated them. She had a very positive response to their smell. So when she actually got close enough to smell them, she went, wait, I know that smell and I like it, right? The other thing is seeing things. Our dogs are not that visual in the sense that they can't see the way we see, but they see movement. And she triggers off of movement a lot. So one of the really great things that we did is we had um, a couple of volunteers, my farm stay and my other farm stay, walk by and um, we fed her for letting her walk, watching him walk by. So she kind of got used to releasing serotonin rather than adrenaline for them walking by. So we talked about the scent, the sight, and now the sound, when she was spending a lot of time in the crate, um, just soothing, she was hearing things constantly and building up her tolerance to hear things, new things, scary things. My dog's barking constantly. Well, not constantly, but you know what I mean? Doing their thing, chasing off coyotes and lots of things to bark at around here. And she was really learning to hear voices and not react. And, um, and then you have taste and touch and taste and touch is up to you. You feed the dog and you massage the dog because we don't want her getting so close, i.e. distance, too quickly, duration to something and having an adrenalized response system. So you can keep distance and duration by using your distraction food to calm her at a distance until she can get a bit closer. 
Once she was getting calm about the sight, the sound, and the smell of the person, we were, we were ready to work on introducing. Now what we do is we introduce somebody to the dog so quickly, they see, smell, hear, taste, and touch, especially if a stranger's like, here, take a cookie. Well, I wanna take the cookie, but I'm so adrenalized that I'm barking at you and you're trying to convince me, here, little girl, have a cookie. It's actually just adding fuel to the fire. When we got her calm enough that she could take food and that she could relax enough in the presence of this person, and then she recognized the smell from already being introduced, which is taste, uh, taste transfer, it's scent transfer um, to the treat, to uh, a positive, um, calm response system. She was actually able to take a treat from one of my farm stays, both of them eventually. But at first, that wasn't where we started. Also, I don't want my dog taking food from strangers. I just want her getting it from me. So she's pairing the food and the release of serotonin, because food creates a release of serotonin in the stomach. It's a neurotransmitter. She's making good, calm memories. And then I can transfer those good, calm memories to that smell, that sight, that sound, with taste and touch, me massaging her and giving her food. Then what we did is we passed the leash to my farm stay and he was able to walk her, which was amazing because we need to get her on a dog walker if Janine ever goes back to work. So we did an entire video on that. Um, and obviously um, the, it, it isn't uh, perfect because we just, we were winging it, but there's a lot of information in that video and I might post that as well um, on how to introduce dogs properly to strangers, especially dogs like Skye who lack the experience of being introduced calmly to strangers. I think the only stranger she's ever met has been in an adrenalized state. They came in the house, immediately she thought, I need to protect my house, that's her breed, and the introduction to people has not been calm. Now maybe she loved those people, and maybe they came in and she met them and it was all excited. Maybe she even had that conflict, I love people, I don't really know what to do. She's wagging her tail and everything. That's no good either. Even when people she knows comes in, she needs to be calm so that she can see the door open and something come in without thinking it's a good witch or a bad witch. So start with the people you know and love. Get her calm with people she knows and loves, which is, you know, Ginny and Steve who own her. It's really important to understand that dogs interpret so much through their nose and they need space and time to do that. So my blind dog could totally function even though he couldn't see. And that's really hard for us to understand. He could see with his nose. He could tell where water was, how far away it was. Dogs are amazing with their nose. But the problem with their noses is they're get, receiving so much information so quickly that a dog like um, Skye will overload and she'll start to freak out. And all the wires in there, all her synapses are snapping. The only thing that's gonna pull her out of that is you getting calm and feeding her to the point where she can take food because if she's not taking food, she's not ready to move forward. You have to increase your distance and take your time. Distance and duration, the food, distraction. Once again, the three Ds. Send transfer, um, we did that actually uh, with um, Florent. I let her smell his boots. That was send transfer. Touch transfer, I took my hand as the first point of contact and brought his hand in and she sniffed his hand and licked it. If he brought his hand towards her, he probably would have done it to the top of her head. I made sure he did it under her chin. I made sure it came in the way I wanted it to, slow and controlled with my scent first. If you bring a hand in with your scent first, then it's 50% safe. And then you can also control, and this is really important with children, where they touch the dog, how they touch the dog, and how fast and how long they stay, right? So when I bring a hand in, I bring it in for just a second, let the dog sniff it, and then I take it back. People think that you can hold your hand out to a dog and they'll sniff it and they'll be okay with it. Dogs like Skye are not. It's too threatening and you've come in right above her, you're making eye contact, it's very threatening for her. She hasn't had that happen as a puppy. She hasn't had enough people pet her to understand it's not threatening. But when your hand is part of it and you bring it in slow and you put it in the right position, you can basically stop the, um, the dog from feeling threatened. And if you do that enough times with your hand, then you can ask the person to go in without your hand. I always ask people to turn sideways, not make direct eye contact. But when I asked Florent, my farm stay, to do it, he was eventually making full eye contact. And then we had him leash her and take her for a walk, which was great, but it took space and time and using treats, duration, distance, distraction, 
right? Again, we come back always to that. The other thing I like to talk about is the art of doing nothing. And the art of doing nothing is the most important thing to do with Sky. Now, for all people, we need to relax, right? But relaxing isn't sleeping. Relaxing is sitting and meditating or doing thoughtful relaxation. She needs to be in an environment at a safe distance where she would previously be excited and, and just relax and do nothing and eat food. So the problem is if we take her to a park and we play with her, you're not using your park time properly. You should have her in a park and be doing nothing and teaching her not to adrenalize and pair adrenaline with dogs, people and sounds and birds and all those things. We need to feed her and just make sure she's constantly calm at the park. So when I go to the park, I do a thing called the art of doing nothing. I sit and I feed my dog and then I leave. I don't come to the park to play. I play at home. The reason I play at home is because there's no distractions and triggers that she can pair with adrenaline. When I'm playing with the dog at home, I make sure I don't get too adrenalized so that eventually I'm teaching her good play habits, but eventually I can teach her low level play and I can introduce that at the park once she's better with all the triggers. And then I can start working her into, well, can you handle these triggers with a low level play? I don't want you playing really hard with her to tire her out. Number one, she's got broken teeth already from playing too rough. But the other reason is um, I need her play to be politer before we can start adding more adrenaline. She has very bad play. It turns into fighting with you. It turns into biting you. So just keep her adrenaline level a little bit lower and switch between art of doing nothing, which is just getting calm and play at a lower level. I know it doesn't seem fair because she can't book it and be super excited and get her rocks off, but she needs to learn to operate at a lower adrenal state and keep her base level of adrenal a lot lower. So it's really important that we don't play with her too excitedly. If I was trying to build a sports dog, I'd be like, yeah, let's jack her up and pair that with um, seeing agility equipment or seeing the decoy, get her jacked up and let her bite the decoy. We're trying to take the drive out of her, not put it in. So really high level adrenalized play paired with anything will pair that thing with the adrenaline and we want to avoid that. So we're going to play with her in the basement at lower levels. So when we're playing with her in the basement at lower levels, we also want to work on her obedience. So we switch between calmness, play, and obedience. Art of doing nothing, play, and obedience. But if we go from play right into obedience, we'll often get some biting and some resistance. So usually what I do is I do play, art of doing nothing, obedience. Those three things in balance are exactly what we need, what dogs need, what everybody needs. You need to have fun. You need to have a purpose. You need to have self-control and you need to self-regulate. You need to be obedient, whether it be to your boss or to yourself or your own you know, um, ideals, but you need to learn how to have some control over yourself then you need to relax. And I'm not talking about when you're sleeping. I'm talking about relaxing in traffic when you wanna kill someone, you know, like controlling your road rage with deep breathing. So those are the three things that I do with my dogs while I'm training. I don't just train obedience. I train calm, I train proper play, and I train, can you be calm and listen to me? So I get the calm first and then we do obedience. We do lots of obedience in the garage and then we take the obedience out into the world. I don't try to get her to do new things around distractions. Most of her training while you're out in the real world is just art of doing nothing. But you can use some obedience just because I think it's helpful to transfer some obedience if it works. But don't ask your dog to sit while they're freaking out. They're not going to do it. You're just going to learn um, non-compliance and you're going to teach them basically um, learned irrelevance is what it's called. So um, that's pretty much everything that we worked on. And I think Janine had a few questions. So Janine, let me, do you wanna shoot me a few questions at the end of this? Yeah, um, my one question is for multi-person households with um, training a new dog, how do you communicate with each other during you know, a walk or what is the best way to do it so that you know, the dog doesn't you know, get upset or Oh, oh, I get what you're saying. So you've got, so you have two things going on. You have a multi-dog household and you have a multi-person household. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is before you go for the walk, plan it. Let's talk it out so we don't argue on the walk and upset the dog. That's really important. 
Um, I gave you a sheet on desensitization and um, basically how to set yourself up to succeed. And that as a couple has to be sat down. We're like, we're gonna take this route. Let's not argue over the route. Let's not argue about who's gonna walk the dog. Let's work it out. Who's gonna take the dog when we're gonna switch hands. Um, what we're gonna do if something happens. So it's a really good thing, um, really good question actually, because if you guys are arguing, and I have this all the time, people are arguing, your focus isn't on your dog. And then all the, it, the energy just kind of shifts. It's not even arguing, like not having a big fight, but there's just tension, right? We wanna reduce all tension. So great question. Reducing tension requires you to have a plan. And I gave you a, a sort of a, a write up on that about how to make your plan before you go out. You gotta be prepared, you gotta have your treats. Are you gonna drive there? When you get there, wh which way are you gonna exit? You know your stuff, talk about it. Use the same words, super important, using the same words, and also knowing that you have to use the same tone. Now, obviously, in couples, a man has a lower voice than a woman, but as a woman, you have to try to lower your tone. We have a tendency to go, good dog, because we've watched all these great videos, but that's enervating. That's what I use for recall. I want my dog to get excited. If they do a good jump, good dog. But if I want them to do something at a lower level, I have to keep my energy low. So as a couple, if you're starting to have tension, just say, you know what? Let's just do some deep breathing and are, are doing nothing. Let's just sit down and because you won't be able to help your dog if you guys are having tension between the two of you. Multi-dog households, the same thing. I asked you not to walk Gretel with her. Now that's not 100% of the time. I don't want you training Sky when Gretel is present because they'll feed off each other. But I would like to see you going out with the two dogs for five minutes, both of you, you and Steve, or, or the two partners, one taking one, one taking the other, and just doing nothing. Because really what I want is them to walk while they're doing nothing, but maybe I can't get that yet. So I don't want to avoid taking the two dogs out together. I want to avoid taking the two dogs out together if we're going to fail. So what do we do? We don't go as far, not as long, and we take treats. Distance, duration, and distraction. You have to start working your two dogs together, but you don't have to take them to the park and let them freak out. You just have to take them in front of the house and watch the world go by and feed them for a half an hour together. Teach them to exist together before you add any activity to it. I think people just wanna do what they did before and then just add another dog into it. It doesn't work that way. You have to teach both dogs how to handle stress and realize that they too have this um, dynamic between them, just like you and your husband have a dynamic that might not be able to withstand um, you know, a certain amount of tension. So we're gonna keep the tension low and the time short and then build the time up and then add distractions and then pull back the treats and then you'll be walking for an hour with the two of them eventually pick pick your places drive there if you have to if i i will drive dogs to a um football field and i'll walk the baseball diamond or the football diamond or whatever they call them field along the fence line with two dogs when nobody's there and that's a walk we haven't gone to new territory where we will run into crazy things that they'll react to but we've gone someplace where they can succeed. Maybe I just do that for five minutes because that's all I have time for. But I won't walk them there where we run into the Joneses and their dogs and cats and squirrels. And by the time they get to that park, they are freaking out. That's your plan. Okay. And what about um, a training journal? Like, how do you feel about about keeping track of like the successes and the failures of what we may be doing incorrectly after? I think that's extremely important. I have about a hundred journals. I actually just burnt most of them because I'll never read them again. So I have a really good um, pad of paper where I keep track of what I'm doing, what works and what doesn't. And then I transfer that information daily. You're probably not gonna go back and read it. But what you wanna do is not have like this long running novel, bullet points. And as you move forward, adjust your bullet points to the next thing. There is actually um, a really good thing from Absolute Dog that I had that is like a pad of paper that has notes on it. Just keep track and move forward as you keep track. Don't keep a diary as per se, keep a um, almost like a, you might even wanna do it on a calendar or like I keep a journal of almost everything, but like these are bullet points instead of like a f free flowing um, paragraph. So keep it really simple so it's really easy and when you're keeping a journal, what you want to ask yourself is what we're working on, how we're working on it, what we're changing, and sort of what our goals are, and always have your goals and move forward. 
but don't keep it as a journal that you're gonna reflect on necessarily. Like it's really fun to reflect on it and go, oh my gosh, she hasn't reacted in five months. You know, that's really cool. But not if you have to read a, an entire book. So my idea is to keep spaces between my bullet points so they're easy to read and that when I look at them, I don't get overwhelmed. Does that make sense? And actually, if you have a through line, so ask yourself distance, duration, and distraction. Keep a through line of distance, duration, and distraction. How close do we get? How long can we do? Uh, how much food do we have to use? And then, oh, we're adjusting. We're using less food. We're getting closer. That, that's an excellent question. If you're, if you're journaling, maybe make your through line distance, duration, and distraction. And then always ask yourself if you failed, how do we need to get further away? Do we need to use better treats? Do I need to block her? Ask yourself which one you failed at. And then also ask yourself about the five senses. Is there something I could have done to calm her senses, help her relax? And sometimes that is actually giving her gabapentin like before she goes to the vet, things like that, where you don't have control over how quickly you're gonna go in. Arrive early, get her calm give her lots of treats sometimes you're not allowed to feed them before the vet that really sucks yeah that's true and massage helps a lot and time space and time huge okay anything else no i think that's all my questions perfect and sky's leaving today she is a better dog than when she arrived she's got a lot of work to do but a lot of this is to do with a fear phase dogs go into fear phase the ones that were too ballsy and didn't go into a fear phase as they were going into their adolescence well they were too brave and they died. They fell out of the gene pool. So it's really normal for dogs to do that. Um, with Sky, because of her breeding, they have bred the most adrenalized dogs with the most adrenalized dogs with the most adrenalized dogs because they were breeding protection dogs and sport dogs. She's not really a pet dog. That doesn't mean that she can't learn to relax. It just means that she triggers really quickly because that's what she was bred to do. She's not being a bad dog. She can't control it any more than I can control a sneeze. When she wants to bark, it's because her adrenaline's high and she's gotta let it out. When she wants to protect you, that's the song of her people. We just need to desensitize her to the point where she can handle more and more and more. And as she gets older, she will have little slip backs. She'll have a thing called extinction bursts where she goes back to her old ways just because sure this doesn't work. And that's normal through evolution to try things that used to work to see if they work again. That's part of our, our um, DNA as well. And then you'll have a thing called response perseverance where she just perseveres with something because her brain is wired for it. And that'll light up the old pathway, the neural pathway will light it up and then you'll have to put it back into extinction or remission because it'll never be fully extinct in a dog like her into remission by using distance, duration, and distraction. You might have to pull out the treats again. You're like, I thought we were done with this. Well, at about two years old, when she's going right into her adulthood, you might see a, a resurgence of some really bad behaviors. And you ask yourself, oh, do we have to go back to more of the art of doing nothing? Yes. Do we have to go back to our old protocols? Yes. But it will be an extinction burst or what they call an extinction burst, which is really just putting it back into remission because it'll always be back there. That's her. That's what makes her a, a Czech Shepherd. <laughs> All those really great things makes her an excellent sport dog, an excellent police dog, an excellent search and rescue dog, a hard to handle pet. Great. Yep. Thanks, Janine. Thank you.